Well, it is a tremendous honor for me to be with you, and I want you to know how much I respect and love your pastor and his wife, Mark and Linda Cowart. So join me in thanking the Lord for such tremendous pastors right here. You know, he has a heart for the city. He has a heart for the world. But one of the greatest joys I see is uh, they have a heart to see you be all that God made you to be and see you blossom in, in the ministry. And there's a joy that he sees when he has, tells me about the different people involved in different things and how they're all getting involved. <clears throat> and that truly is a great pastor. And that's one of the things that uh, goes back to the, the pilgrims. And so uh, Thanksgiving, and we are in the year 2022. And, you know, I ran track in high school and uh, did the relays. And uh, there's a baton that gets passed off. And so there was the early church. Jesus died, rose again, and you got uh, Peter and the apostles. Well, they passed the, the baton off to, you know, all the, the early different uh, leaders, and then it got passed off, and it went through the Middle Ages, and then it went through the, the Reformation, and then it gets passed off, and, and then it finally comes to us. And I think there's something to be gained by knowing the price that was paid to give us this faith that we enjoy, that we can have a relationship with God through Jesus. We don't have to be persecuted by the government. Uh, a price was, was paid all through that 2,000 years. And so when we talk about the pilgrims, it's one of those chapters that I think you'll find interesting. So I, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, do a, my PowerPoint presentation. And if I, uh, if, let's see if I need to press uh, a couple things here. And... I think that's it. Now, can you see that on the screen? Okay, there we go. So we're going to jump into the 1500s, and uh, we have the Ottoman Empire. Now, it used to all be Christian. North Africa used to have 250 Catholic dioceses until the uh, Umayyad Muslims conquered it. Egypt had been Christian for six centuries until the Muslim leader Amir Ibn al-Las conquered it. Uh, Jerusalem and, the, and Syria used to be Christian for six centuries. Christ, Christ, the word Christian was first used in Syria. And uh, the Apostle Paul evangelized Syria uh, until Caliph Umar conquers it. And then the Turks convert to Islam and they conquer into what is today Turkey. So all seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation were wiped out by the Muslim Turks. And then they conquer into Eastern Europe. And they're at the gates of Vienna in 1529. So now we're up to the 1500s. And in the middle of all this, you have the Reformation starts with Martin Luther. And so the king of Spain, the most powerful guy in the world... Uh, he has Spain, by marriage Portugal, and parts of Italy, the Netherlands, Austria, and then the New World, and then the Philippines are named after his son, King Philip of Spain. Uh, he has a double dilemma. He has this Protestant Reformation that started on the inside of Europe and this Islamic invasion from the outside of Europe. And he actually tries to stop both for decades. And then he realizes he can't and he needs the Protestants' help. And so he makes a deal with the Protestants called the Peace of Augsburg of 1555. It's the first treaty ever to recognize Protestants. And in there is a little Latin phrase that had enormous repercussions. It was cuios regio eus religio, which means whose is the reign, his is a religion. So in other words, look, Protestant king, believe whatever you want in your kingdom. Let's just work together against this Islamic invasion. And so that began something in Europe. Instead of Western Europe being all Catholic, now each country had its own different denomination. England was Anglican, Scotland Presbyterian, Holland Dutch Reformed, Switzerland Calvinist, you get the picture. But it was if you did not believe the way your particular king did, it was considered treason. And so let's zero in on England because that's where the pilgrims came from and we're talking Thanksgiving. So in the 1500s, England had a king named Henry VIII and he was married to Catherine of Aragon, the daughter of the king of Spain. Right? So she's like the daughter of the most powerful guy in the world. After 18 years, she does not have a son, and Henry wants a son, and so he decides to divorce her. And the Pope won't recognize the divorce because she is, after all, the daughter of the most powerful guy in the world. And so the Pope says no, and Henry says, you know what? I'm just going to make myself my own Pope. He starts the Church of England, puts himself at the top. And he's got this hierarchy of Archbishop of Canterbury, Archbishop of York, and the, the deaneries and vicars and curates and so forth. And he ends up having six wives. <laughs> 
their fates were divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Not a really nice guy to be married to. And his advisor said, King, if you're serious about breaking from Rome, you need to stop using the Latin Bible. You need to get yourself an English Bible. The German princes have Martin Luther's German Bible. That helped them to break away from Rome. You need an English Bible. And Henry says, fine, get me one. Well, it just so happens a few years earlier, Henry VIII had William Tyndall, <coughs> excuse me, burnt at the stake for translating the Bible into English. And William Tyndall's last words were, Lord, ope, open the King of England's eyes. And so the King of England, a couple years later, decides he wants an English Bible. So they take Tyndall's work, polish it up. They call it the Great Bible. And Henry likes it, and he orders a copy of it put in every church in England. This is the first time the common people of England can read the Bible in their own English language. There were some scholarly translations before this, but the common people didn't have access to it. This is called the chained Bible because they chained it to the pulpit. It was so valuable. But they were like, you know, renting time. To, it's like, your turn's up. Let me read the Bible. And they were like, wow, they could read it for their, themselves. They were so excited. And so the king dusts his hands and says, that's it. We have broken from Rome. No, no more Latin Bible. Got an English Bible. And he thinks that solves the problem. But something unexpected happened. People began to read it. And began to compare what's in the Bible to this king divorcing and beheading his wives. And so a group starts that wants to purify the Church of England. And they're nicknamed the Puritans, right? And the king doesn't think he needs purifying. He thinks he's fine just the way he is. So he persecutes the Puritans. There's another group that said it's beyond hope of purifying. We're going to separate ourselves. And so they call themselves separatists and we call them pilgrims. And some of these separatists branch off and become Baptists. They become Congregationalists. You know, later there's Quakers. And there's lots of different splinter groups breaking away. And um, so there you have this graph. You've got the Catholic Church. Henry breaks away. And then he starts the Anglicans, the Puritans. And then breaking off from that, you have the Pilgrim Separatists. And so the king's attitude was, yes, you can finally read the Bible in your own ing English language. But no, you still can't believe whatever you want. You got to believe what I tell you to believe. I'm the king. And so you do not make up prayers because you could make up a prayer that's wrong. So the government wrote all the possible prayers they could think of down in a book called the Book of Common Prayer. And when you want to pray, you just open it to the right page and read the prayer. And if you're caught with a little group making up your own prayers, the government, the FBI will bust into your house and arrest you and drag you away to some government hearing room, right? It's called the star chamber because it had stars on the ceiling, sort of like a January 6th hearing room. And um, then they, <laughs> and they would question you and they would interrogate you and they would cut off your ear and brand you on the face as a heretic and make you confess to something you didn't do. And uh, then they passed the Five Mile Act. If you were caught preaching within five miles of a town without approval of the government, you're a criminal. They drag you before that star chamber. Then they passed the Conventicle Act. It comes from the word covenant. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst. And um, they later changed the name of it to the Riot Act. Because you could be planning an insurrection in your little Bible study. And so the police would show up at your house, bust up your Bible study, pull out a piece of paper, and read the Riot Act that says everyone must immediately disperse or we're gonna drag you before that hearing chamber room and we'll lock you away forever and you'll die. And you know who was caught during this? John Bunyan, having a Bible study. He hadn't gotten it approved by the government and they drag him away. He says, better to be persecuted than be the persecutor. He spent 12 years wasting away in some prison and that's when he writes Pilgrim's Progress. And so we look at what the people that have passed the baton to us went through to be able to give us the freedom where we can read the Bible in our own language. We can pray anytime we want. Now, a little big picture. I always, in history, like to zoom in and zoom out. So let's zoom out what's going on. Um, at this time, you have the Muslims not just surrounding Vienna, but they're taking over the Mediterranean. Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, and then you have the Battle of Lepanto. It's the biggest battle ever on the Mediterranean Sea. And King Charles V's son, Philip, 
and, and they fight and the, the Spanish win. So it stops the Muslims there. But instead of going around the Mediterranean and, and freeing up other cities from Islamic control, Philip II decides to smash the Reformation that's taking place in Holland and in England. And so the very next year, 1572, he sends the Iron Duke of Alba to Antwerp, Holland, and they killed tens of thousands of Protestants. They just pile them in the street. And, uh, and then he sends his Spanish armada to smash the Reformation in England. Luckily, it was um, for England, it was destroyed in a hurricane. And then let's look at France. So you have these French wars of religion. There is the Medici family out of Florence, Italy, and they're very wealthy, and they marry their kids to all the monarchs of Europe. It's just, a, you know, you read this history of this period, everybody's got relatives, and they're all kings, and so So you have Catherine de' Medici, and she's married to the king of France. He dies. So she rules France through her young son, and now he's around 11, and he Mar she marries him to Mary Queen of Scots from Scotland. And she's this young girl and she comes over there. Well, when he's around 13, he dies. And rather than making Mary Queen of Scots the queen of France, uh, she puts her on a boat and sends her back to Scotland. And, um, and then you have, you know, John Knox preaches to this young girl. And, and anyway, um, and so now the Medici, Catherine de Medici of France is ruling through her other son, <laughs> and, um, and then she decides um, there's about 15% of the country is uh, Protestant. They call them Huguenot or Huguenot uh, Protestants. And so there's going to be a wedding in Paris. And so they have the, all the Huguenot Protestant leaders show up. And Henry of Navarre is getting married to the daughter of um, Catherine de' Medici, uh, Margaret de Valois. And uh, the wedding takes place, but then a couple days after... She has them pull the chains across the street. Every street in Paris, you know, they had like stone pillars and with chains, would, so the carriages couldn't get out of town. And they proceed to kill tens of thousands of Protestants. And they fill up the River Seine with bodies. And uh, there's Catherine de' Medici walking out the next day, right? And so um, in Europe, it was the king. They had kings and, and you were taught to obey the king. But after the, the king and the monarch you know, of these countries are killing people, uh, the thought came, well, should we submit to the king? And so John Calvin, uh, he writes, when kings disobey God, they automatically abdicate their worldly power. And uh, then he writes in Institutes, he who does not make his reign subservient to divine glory acts the part not of a king, but of a robber. We are subject to the men who rule over us, but subject only in the Lord. If they command anything against him, let us not pay the least regard to it. The king has exceeded his limits by raising his horn against God, had virtually abrogated his power. This was a new, new thing in Europe because you were taught, okay, Romans 13, you got to submit to the government, you got to submit to the government. It's like, okay, what if the government wants to flat out kill you? And so it's this concept of the Bible says, children, obey your parents. But what if there's a parent that tells the kid, hey, go out and sell drugs. Go out and uh, rob and steal and sell yourself into prostitute and kill your neighbor. <laughs> Is the kid supposed to obey? No, the kid obeys the parents as long as the parents submit in, in, to God and tells them to do godly things. And so this was applied to these kings. And he's like, okay, if the king is, is out there to kill you, then, you know, and so the Calvinists uh, translated the Geneva Bible and it had uh, zero references to church, wherever the Greek word ecclesia was, it translated it congregation or assembly. And it had all these margin notes talking about how the people can rule themselves under God without a king. And, and so these Calvinist Puritans were developing this concept a century before Europe's Age of Enlightenment. You know, I read a lot of history books and they say, oh, the founders got their idea from the Age of Enlightenment. No, this is before that. These are the Calvinist Puritans. And, and so Secretary of Navy George Bancroft, Puritanism exalted the laity. The laity is the people, and now the people are, are becoming sovereign. They're learning how to rule. And so where did they get their idea from the Bible? What part of the Bible? The first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. And this per period of history called the Hebrew Republic. And these Christ Calvinist Puritans are called Christian Hebraists. I mean, they studied the Talmud, Mamanides, a famous rabbi. They studied all that, and they were experts. 
And so, lo and behold, both the king and the Puritans used the Bible as their source of authority, but the Calvinist Puritans looked to the, king, the pre-King Saul period. What's that? So they come out of Egypt around 1400 BC, and for 400 years, the Israelites do not have a king. It's a system where every single person is taught the law, and every single person is personally accountable to God to follow the law. And then when you break the law, you bring a sacrifice, and you're forgiven, and then the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, they sacrifice for the whole country, and everybody gets to start the new year off with a clean slate, and obviously that's foreshadowing Jesus. But the Calvinist Puritans looked to the pre-King Saul period as the original plan God had for his people, no king. But the king of England, they looked to the King Saul and on period of the Bible as the anointed king, right? So these Congregationalists, um, it comes from the word ecclesia, Greek, ek means out of, ecclesia means a calling. There were 6,000 citizens in Athens and they would call them out of their homes to deliberate. And so it's a model of government. Instead of it being the king through the Archbishop of Canterbury and all this type of stuff, a hierarchical relationship, it's a congregational model. So the pastor gets everybody to have their own relationship with God through Jesus Christ and then coaches them to become mature Christians. Read the Bible every day, pray, and then plug into the body. And, you know, because anything that's alive takes in and gives out. Every muscle to grow has to be exercised. For you to grow as a Christian, you got to hear great messages, but you got to put yourself in a position where you're giving out, right? And um, so the king didn't like that model of government. He liked the hierarchical model. That's why I did not like the COVID response, because it was changing church structure. It was saying, okay, don't meet together. Just, just watch the screen. And you can hear the best message through the screen, but you can't give out. What, are you going to witness to your pillow? <laughs> No, you, you have to get together. So, so somebody that's filled full of the Holy Ghost is around somebody with a need, and, and water seeks its own level. The, the Holy Spirit will prompt you to minister to that person. You know what I'm talking about. And so ministry takes place in the, in the lobby of the church around coffee, right? The older woman sees the younger woman, says, hey, you're a little worried. What's wrong? Well, the kids are sick, this and that. And they pray together, and the older guy says, tells the younger guy, hey, we're having a little Bible study. Come on. And there's ministry taking place without pastor having to organize it. And you're blessed here because Pastor Mark, is, it takes joy in seeing you ministering to each other. And so King James says that these Puritans and these separatists, I will make them conform themselves or else I will harry them out of the, their land or do even worse. So here you got these government mandates saying you got to obey these government mandates. So different groups of church government were being formed. Anglicans had the bishops, but Presbyterians would elect elders and they would rule. Then you had independent congregations, and then you had the Quakers. They were like the far end where they had no pastor and no elders. It was just a society of friends. You know, you get a bunch of people together and, and they would wait for someone to be moved upon by the Holy Spirit to say something. And it's, you know, it's, it's a church model and it, it worked for them, but um, it's interesting, John Adams was from the Puritan Congregationalist Massachusetts. And when the Continental Congress Revolutionary War is starting, he goes to Philadelphia. It's the first time he's ever been out of Massachusetts. And he uh, visits other churches. And there's a Catholic church, he goes to visits that. He, goes to, he visits a Quaker meeting. And he says, we sat around for two hours waiting for someone to be moved upon, and nobody did, so we went down to the pub. <laughs> I think that's sort of funny. Um, anyway, so, um, so we have one of these separatist groups uh, is founded by a guy named John Smith, not the one with Pocahontas. This is a different one. Um, a Thomas Hellwise First Baptist Church in England. So this is the First Baptist Church with fresh light upon the Pilgrim Father's Church. Lo and behold, the pilgrims split off of this Baptist church. So the, this church was founded by John Smith, sometimes with a Y, spelled John Merton, Thomas Hellwise. So let's look at um, John Merton, one of these Baptist founders. He's arrested, put in the Newgate prison where he dies. But they didn't feed you in the Newgate prison. Uh, you had to have some friend that missed you and would bring you some food. And they would bring him a, a bottle of milk. But instead of a cork, it had a wad of paper. When nobody was around, he unfolded the paper, took a splinter, dipped it in the milk, and he'd write out his pamphlets. And then his friend would take it home and unfold it, hold it above a candle, and the heat of the candle would turn the milk brown, and they could see what he wrote, and they'd typeset the little pamphlets and print them. And of course, the government's like, how is he getting that out of the prison cell? And, 
And so one of the things he wrote, so the Baptist called the milk of the word because he wrote it in milk, but the scripture talks about, you know, the young believers, the milk of the word. So here's something he wrote from his prison. No man ought to be persecuted for his religion. Something else he wrote from prison, the practices of Christ and his disciples teaches no such thing as compelling men by persecution and afflictions to obey the gospel. And then another Baptist founder who dies in the Newgate prison is Thomas Hellwise. And he says, the king is a mortal man and not God. Therefore, he had no power over the mortal soul of his subjects to make laws and ordinances for them, to set spiritual lords over them. For men's religion to God is betwixt God and themselves. The king shall not answer for it, neither may the king be judged between God and men. This was a revolutionary idea. This idea that, okay, if the government can stand there on the day of judgment and answer for why you believe something, fine, believe whatever they want. You know, if they want to change the definition of sex, definition of marriage, uh, if, if they're going to be there on the day of judgment and, and explain to God why you believe something, fine, believe whatever the government tells you. But if the government's not going to be there on the day of judgment, you are accountable to God for your own conscience. And so the, Roger Williams, Baptist founder of Rhode Island, said, God requires not a uniformity of religion to be enacted and enforced in any civil state. Enforced uniformity is the greatest occasion of uh, civil war, ravishing of conscience, persecution of Christ Jesus in his servants. Persecution for the cause of conscience is most contrary to the doctrine of Christ Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Roger Williams' statue is in the U.S. Capitol as the founder of Rhode Island. And they have all these plaques in Rhode Island, and it talks about Roger Williams' um, uh, exile for his devotion to freedom of conscience. And uh, another one, that he founded Providence, Rhode Island for persons distressed of conscience. And um, another one, Roger Williams, an exile for the freedom of conscience, and so forth. And he starts the first Baptist church in America. And uh, William Penn's put in the Tower of London, um, around the 1680s, and he uh, says, uh, force makes hypocrites. Tis persuasion only that makes converts. Your spirit, mind, and body. And um, God wants to appeal to your mind so you understand the gospel. He wants to appeal to your heart so you make a voluntary decision. He doesn't want to have you believe because you're afraid your body will get cut to pieces, right? So this is what some of those people that passed the baton down to us went through. Why do we share this? Because we're sort of entering a period where there's hostility toward Christianity and we're carrying on the torch. You know, we have to remind ourselves the church was birthed into a one world anti-Christian government, the Roman Empire. I mean, if I were gonna start a movement, I was like, you know, let it have a little greenhouse, let it go for without, without persecution for a little while, get strong first and then let the, the storms hit it. No, no, no. Immediately, the early church was persecuted. And they dragged Peter before the Sanhedrin and said, we ordered you, we gave you a government mandate, do not speak in this person's name. And Peter said, it's better to obey God rather than men. You know, I was sort of, I'm not a theologian, but I was talking to a pastor. I said, you know, maybe, maybe one, of, one of the evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit is standing up to corrupt government. <laughs> I mean... I mean, think of it, here's Peter before the resurrection, and when, you know, he denies Christ. But after the resurrection and after he's filled with the Holy Spirit, he immediately stands up and says, I'm not gonna cave, I'm gonna stand up for, the, for Jesus. Anyway, so we see this persecution going on. These pilgrim separatists flee to Holland, and did you know they were originally gonna flee to Guyana, South America? William Bradford writes, some had thought and were earnest for Guyana. Those for Guiana allege that the country was rich, fruitful, blessed with a perpetual spring. But it was, uh, to this it was answered that it was out of the question. If they should go there, should live there, uh, if, if they should there live and do well, the jealous Spaniard would never suffer them long, but would displant or overthrow them as he did the French in Florida. Okay, what's the French in Florida? Um, you know, the, in France, Catherine de Medici, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, the, the, after that wedding, you know, killing everybody and throwing their bodies in this. And so there were this, these French po Protestants began to flee from France. And in 1565, you had, some of them went to Florida. 
and they started a little colony around where today Jacksonville, Florida is. And Spain found out about it, and uh, that King Philip of Spain uh, went over there and uh, killed him. And uh, here's 1989 Representative Charles E. Bennett recited, in the 425th anniversary of the beginning settlements by Europeans renamed from Fort Caroline to San Mateo to San Nicolas to Calford, finally to Jacksonville in 1822. He said, um, three small ships carrying 300 Frenchmen led by Rene de Laudonner anchored in the river known today as St. John's. On June 30th, 1564, construction of a triangular shaped fort was begun with the help of the local Indians, the Timucan Indians. Home for this hardy group of Huguenots, their strong religious motivations inspired them. Fort Caroline existed, but for a short time. Spain captured the fort and slaughtered most of the inhabitants in September of 1565. And so these pilgrims are like, okay, we don't want to go anywhere near where Spain is. And so they leave Holland and they decide they're going to go to Jamestown, Virginia. And um, Virginia was a king-run colony. And uh, uh, they had this as part of their law. There shall be a uniformity in our church as near as may be to the canons in England. So the, that meant you had to be an Anglican. Uh, none be permitted to pass in any voyage to Virginia to said country, but shall as first have taken the oath of supremacy. <clears throat> what is the oath of supremacy? Well, that's Henry VIII, 1535. I declare that the King's Highness is the only supreme governor of this realm in all spiritual or ecclesiastical things. You had to say that the government was the head of the church. The government would dictate, not to take this oath was considered treason. You had to say, okay, whatever the government tells me to believe, I'm gonna believe it. When you blow the trumpets, I'll bow to your statue, you know. Now, this is sort of humorous. Um, there was no gold in Virginia. The first ship they sent back was filled full of fake gold. It's called iron pyrite or fool's gold. And uh, they thought that Virginia was gonna be like, you know, the Caribbean and, and the, you know, Inca, Peru. They thought there would be like all kinds of gold there. And so they fill it and it's, it's it's iron pyrite, it was worthless. And so um, they had to come up with another crop and lo and behold, it ended up being tobacco. And they, 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 had, they saw the Indians, the Indians were really healthy, the Indians smoked peace pipes, and so they said, okay, they smoke tobacco, they're really healthy, so tobacco makes you healthy. <laughs> and so this becomes a craze in Europe where everybody's wanting to smoke tobacco thinking it's gonna make them healthy. And so um, anyway, you didn't just have to go to the king's church in Virginia. If you didn't show up, this is what they said. Whosoever shall absent himself from divine service any Sunday without an allowable excuse shall forfeit a pound of tobacco. <laughs> hey, miss you at church on Sunday, uh, tobacco. <laughs> uh, and so it was almost, the pilgrims were gonna go to Virginia, but they got blown off course in a storm. A long story, it's a 3,000 mile journey, it takes 66 days. I mean, they, their ship starts leaking, and they, they, the main beam cracks, and they're confined to a four foot section, 102 of them. And um, one of the young pilgrims is washed overboard, and they fish him back in, John Howland. And they finally get to the shores of America, and they are hundreds of miles away from Virginia. And they try sailing south, but off the coast of Cape Cod, it's really shallow. And uh, it says, Cape Cod, after some deliberation, they tacked about southward to find some place about Hudson's River. But they fell among dangerous shoals. That's where, ever been to a beach and you walk out 100 yards and it only comes up to like your waist or something? You could be a half mile off the coast of Cape Cod. It's only six feet deep. And ships would get stuck in the sand when storms. And it says, uh, dangerous shoals and roaring breakers. And they were so far entangled. So that 3,000 ships have sunk off the coast of Cape Cod. So they go back to, to uh, Plymouth Rock and the captain of the boat says, everyone off the boat, too dangerous to do any more sailing. And so they do the Mayflower Compact. Having undertaken for ye glory of God and advancement of ye Christian faith, a voyage to plant ye first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. But it's for the Christian faith that they came over. Now they had a problem. There was no king appointed person in their boat. They were going to go to Jamestown and submit to the king's government and say, okay, whatever the government tells us. And they, and they figured they'd be 3,000 miles away so they could do their little pilgrim stuff and nobody would notice. But um, they're on the boat and, uh, and they're tell, being told to get off and there's just a beach. There's, there's no government to submit to. And there's, everyone's so used to submitting to government, submitting to They do something unique. 
they give themselves the authority to start a government. The Mayflower Compact. It says, we, in the presence of God, covenant ourselves into a civil body politic. So these pilgrim separatists, you know, offshoot of the Baptists, um, there were some strangers amongst them, so just a few of them, but, um, but here they are, a church group forming itself into a civil body politic. Let me say that again. A church forming itself into a political body. Right? So nowadays they're saying, oh, church don't get involved in politics when our country was started with a church that did get involved in politics. Why did they do that? To enact just and equal laws that shall be thought most meet unto which we promise all due submission. Simple, revolutionary. It was a polarity change in the flow of power on planet Earth. Instead of rule by kings top down, Pharaoh, Caesars, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsar, you do what the government mandates or they're going to kill you. It's ruled bottom up by we, just us in this little boat. And um, it's the difference between a dead pyramid top down and a living tree where every root and every little capillary root sucks in nutrients to keep it uh, alive. Every single person's involved in church, the congregational model, every single person's involved in the government. And so um, where did they get their idea to do this? Their pastor, John Robinson, who had split off from John Smith's church. And this painting hangs in our U.S. Capitol Rotunda in Washington, D.C. Miracle of Squanto, I got to throw this in. So the pilgrims land uh, around November 20th, 1620. And um, the first winter uh, is really cold and half of them die. 102 of them, only half survive till spring. And William Bradford writes in the history of the Plymouth Settlement, about the 16th of March, a certain Indian came boldly amongst them and spoke to them in broken English. His name was Samoset. He told them also of another Indian whose name was Squanto, a native of this place who had been in England and could speak English better than himself. Governor Bradford writes, a few days later came Squanto and the chief Massasoit. Massasoit, who about four or five days after came with the chief, his friends, and attendants with Squanto. And um, they made peace, which continued now for 24 years. Squanto stayed with them and was their interpreter. And a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond their expectation. <clears throat> it appears that Squanto had been kidnapped. Now, the pilgrims were religious, but there were other people who were not religious. They were more or less pirates. So Spain had the Caribbean, and you would have English pirates, French pirates, Dutch pirates raiding the Spanish ships, and they were not very scrupulous. And so they would go along the coast of North America and lure some Indians on board and then lock them below deck and then take them to Spain and sell them at Malaga into, the, into slavery. Make a quick buck. And, uh, and so evidently that is what happened to Squanto. Around 1605, he and some of the others tribe. Um, and then uh, he was uh, purchased by some monks who gave him his freedom. And uh, then he travels across in Europe and he makes his way back to England. And uh, could you imagine, here's this, he's probably the only Indian in all of England. And so he's there for almost a decade, learning their language, working jobs and everything. And finally finds a fishing business uh, that'll drop him off in Newfoundland. And then he finds another one that he's, you know, their interpreter is showing him the good fishing spots and they finally take him back to where his tribe was in 1619, just the year before the pilgrims show up. And he gets off to find his entire tribe had died. And um, he goes and lives amongst the neighboring Wampanoag tribe. And um, now as tragic as his kidnapping was, had he not been kidnapped, he most certainly would have died in that plague. And so William Bradford talks about how a couple years earlier, a French ship was shipwrecked right there at Cape Cod, those shoals I was telling you about. And he says, about three years before, a French ship was wrecked at Cape Cod, but the men got ashore and saved their lives and a part, large part of their provisions. When the Indians heard it, they surrounded them and never left watching them and dogging them till they got the advantage and killed them, all but three or four whom they kept and sent from one sachem chief to another, making sport with them, using them worse than slaves. Evidently, one of them had an illness and the Indians did not have immunity and it wiped out the tribe. And so the pilgrims, in a sense, landed on the one spot on the eastern seaboard that was uninhabited because the other tribes wouldn't even dare to go on to that land. And so Squanto, you can just picture... Here are these pilgrims. Half of them die the first winter. I mean, there were only four married women the next spring, right, out of this pilgrim group. And, and, um, and they don't know how they're going to survive. And out of the woods walks this Indian. 
I mean, I, I can picture Squanto's in his teepee and he's all depressed. My tribe's dead. And then this guy comes in the, and says, hey, Squant, you wouldn't believe this. There's a bunch of people from England wanting to start a settlement in your old tribal stomping ground. And so Squanto, you know, shows up and, and uh, they write about how, um, you know, everybody panics because a lone Indian walks right into their settlement. And they're all like, you know, and he comes up to him and, and he says, hi, are you guys from London? Y yeah, I used to live there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, the pub down on Wharf Street and St. Paul's Chapel and all that, you know. And then he says, oh, here, I grew up here. I know this place like the back of my hand over the hills of spring. And, and William Bradford says that he showed him how to plant corn. They said, we tried that. He goes, no, 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 you got to take some fish, put the fish in the hole and then put the corn in and then cover it over. The fish will decompose, fertilize the soil and you'll have a nice. And then he taught him how to take the corn and put it in a pot, shake it over a fire and make popcorn. And um, then he, uh, it says that, um, what? N neither, nor was there a man among them who had ever seen a beaver skin till they were instructed by Squanto. And so it took 40 years. So the Caribbean had gold, uh, Virginia had tobacco, what was the cash crop? It, was, it took 40 years worth of beaver skins for the pilgrims to pay off their boat ride because they had to borrow money for that. But Squanto, and so Squanto uh, showed them how to go down to the riverbank and, and take off their shoes and squeegee in the mud and catch eels and catch clams and then you know, hang a chicken neck in the water and, and, or you know, turkey neck and catch a, a lobster and you know, pull it up. And, and, um, and so uh, he was there when they had their first Thanksgiving. And so there were about 50 or so pilgrims. There were 102, but half of them died. And, but they had a harvest of food because of Squanto. And so 90 Indians show up. So the first Thanksgiving had almost twice as many Indians as it did pilgrims. And, um, and so the, the pilgrims had all their food, but the Indians show up with deer and wild turkey. At the end of the day, the Indians roll up in their blankets and go to sleep. And the next day, they're still there. And so they had Thanksgiving a second day. And the boys do foot races and arm wrestling. And then the next day, they roll up in their blankets and go to sleep. And the next day, so the first Thanksgiving went on for three days. And um, so again, yeah, Swanto says, uh, William Bradford said he was a special instrument sent of good, uh, sent, sent of God for their good. Now, was, what's the Bible story? Joseph, he was sold by his brothers into slavery. And he goes down to Egypt and he... Uh, is a slave, he's in prison, and then finally he interprets a dream, and then he's made right hand of the Pharaoh, and he is able to provide for all of his siblings, uh, the sons of Israel, to come when there's this famine. And so he basically rescues them. And so sometimes in, in our lives, you go through a time where you're sold into slavery. <laughs> Your life collapses. Uh, People are mean and cruel, unimaginably cruel, and, uh, but you just surrender to God. And then God moves things around. And lo and behold, he's able to use you to minister to people. And he's able to use you to rescue people and use you to save people because you've been through that. You know, maybe you lost a loved one or maybe it's been a divorce, discouragement, depression, uh, you know, bankruptcy, so, some crises that you had to walk daily with, with the Lord and you barely could take your next breath. And the, but you finally make it through a day, you make it through a week, you make it through a month and you finally make it through. And then, then the Lord uses you. You're like that Squanto. You're like that Joseph. And you see somebody and they're, they're going through this crisis. You're specially equipped. You're like an interpreter. You can, you can go and say, okay, I, I've been through there. This, I'm with you, this is what's gonna happen. You know, and the scripture here and so forth, you can minister. The apostle Paul says, comfort one another with the comfort wherewith the Lord has comforted you. And um, Romans 8, 28, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So God will use everything in our life for good. And then Philippians, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God wants to work his will in your life. Now, Squanto, uh, a couple years later, he dies, and William Bradford writes about it. He says that they went out exploring, and suddenly it started raining, and it was freezing, freezing cold. And he says they could not get around the shoals, 
That's that sand that goes way out there of Cape Cod or the flats and breakers. So they put in at Manamoyak Bay. Here, Squanto fell ill of Indian fever, bleeding much at the nose, which the Indians take for a symptom of death. And he died within a few days. He begged the governor to pray for him that he might go to the Englishman's God in heaven and bequeathed several of his things to some of his English friends as remembrances. His death was a great loss. But here, he begged the governor to pray for him that he might go to the Englishman's God in heaven, right? He was raised, what, whatever religion it was, but then he's with these pilgrims and he's their interpreter and he's with them. And, and, and he finally says, I want to go to your God. Well, these pilgrims were like real Christians. They were like coming to America because they wanted to have the freedom to worship God with their Christian faith. And he's like, you've got something that I want. And he says, pray for me. I want to go to the English one's God in heaven. I believe that Squanto's in heaven. And um, so uh, another story, Chief Massasoit, remember him? Squanto put him on good terms with the, with the Indians. He falls sick in 1622. And uh, the pilgrim named um, Edward Winslow doctors him up and he gets better. And uh, you know the fine print? When you doctor an Indian chief, if he dies, you die. <laughs> Imagine that to tell a doctor, okay, I want you to take care of him. Of course, if he doesn't get, if he dies, you're going to die. Anyway, he got better. And so that was the beginning of this 50 year peace that the uh, pilgrims had with the Indians. And um, I don't have time to get into it. In 1625, the pilgrims saved up 800 pounds of beaver skins and sent it back to England for trade. And a Turkish man of war. Remember we talked about the Muslim pirates, uh, you know, uh, taking over the, um, uh, the, the Mediterranean Sea? Well, they send pirates up to the English Channel. And so the pilgrims had uh, saved up 800 pounds of beaver skins and sent it back to England when a Turkish man of war captured it. And William Bradford said the adventurers or the investors who financed their, their boat ride and they were paying them back with beaver skins, they sent over two fishing ships. The pinnace was ordered to load with core fish to bring home to England. And besides, she had some 800 pounds of beaver as well as furs to a good value. So they went joyfully home together and had such fine weather that he, uh, the, the big ship didn't cast off the small ship until they were well within the English Channel, almost inside of Plymouth, England. But even there she was unhappily taken by a Turkish man of war and carried off to solid Morocco where the captain and the crew were made slaves. Thus, all their hopes were dashed, and the joyful news they meant to carry home was turned to heavy tidings. The friendly adventurers, investors, were so reduced by their losses last year, and now by the ship taken by the Turks, that all trade was dead. So even the pilgrims had to deal with uh, the Islamic terrorism there. And then... Um, uh, one of the stories, because I talk, uh, talk on um, socialism, uh, the pilgrims, again, they, they had no money. They were borrowing it from these investors who had formed the London Company. And the London Company said for the first seven years, everything would be owned in common. And um, he says, all profits and benefits that are got by trade, traffic, trucking, working, fishing, or any other means shall remain in ye common stock. And all are to have their meat, drink, and apparel, and all provision out of ye common stock. So it was like a socialism. Right, everything goes there and everything. They tried it and they almost starved to death. William Bradford says the failure, failure of that experiment of communal service, which was tried for several years by good and honest men, proves the emptiness of the theory of Plato and other ancients applauded by some of latter times, that the taking away of private property and possession of it in community would make a state happy and flourishing, as if they were wiser than God. For in this instance, community of property was found to breed much confusion and discontent, retard much employment, which would have been to the general benefit. For the young men, who were most able and fit for service, objected to being forced to spend their time and strength in working for other men's wives and children without any recompense. The strong man or the resourceful man had no more share of food, clothes, etc., than the weak man, who was not able to do a quarter what the other could. This was thought injustice. The aged and graver men who were ranked and equalized in labor, food, clothes, etc., with the humbler and younger ones thought it some indignity and disrespect to them. As for men's wives who were obliged to do service for other men, such as cooking, washing their clothes, etc., they considered it a kind of slavery, and many husbands would not brook it or allow it. You're not going to wash that other guy's clothes. <laughs> Let none argue that this is due to human failing rather than to this communistic plan of life in itself. 
I answer that God, in his wisdom, saw that another plan of life was fitter for them. So they began to consider how to raise more corn, obtain a better crop, so they might not continue to endure the misery of want, like starving through a winter. After much debate, the governor with the chief among them allowed each man to plant corn for his own household. Wow, what a novel idea. (laughs) You plant corn for your household. So every family was assigned a parcel of land. This was very successful. It made all hands very industrious so that much more corn was planted than otherwise would have been and gave far better satisfaction. The women now went willingly into the field and took their little ones with them to plant corn, while before they would allege weakness and inability and to have compelled them would have been thought great oppression. Right, so here are these pilgrims, they tried, hey, let's just own everything together. I mean, they're Christians, they even tried it. And it, they almost starved. They said, okay, forget all that. You get your own land. And then once they got this abundant harvest, then they would voluntarily take care of their neighbor. So they moved from a company form of government to a covenant form of government. An involuntary government saying, okay, we're going to take away your stuff and we're going to redistribute it. To, no, you get your stuff And then you go to church and you hear this talk that God loves you and wants you to share your love with others, and then you voluntarily take care of your neighbor. And lo and behold, through our history, it was churches that started hospitals, churches that started medical clinics, churches that started schools and orphanages. And you know, you got William and Catherine Booth started the Salvation Army, and Sir George Williams starts the YMCA. And I mean, here's Clara Barton, a school teacher. She starts the American Red Cross. You got people doing stuff. It's not the government. It's a voluntary thing. So this is called the covenant form of government that these Puritans got from ancient Israel, where you get rights and blessings from God. And then you voluntarily take care of your neighbor because you're doing it as unto God. And so the pastor of the pilgrims, right, this John Robinson who split off from that John Smith church, uh, he says, we are knit together as a body in covenant of the Lord, We so hold ourselves tied to all uh, care for each other's good. So they're going to care for each other. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher said, Your founding fathers looked after one another, not only as a matter of necessity, but as a matter of duty to their God. And then the Calvinist Puritan founder of Massachusetts, John Winthrop, this love among Christians is a real thing, not imaginary. It's absolutely necessary to the being of the body of Christ. We are a company professing ourselves fellow members of Christ. We ought to account ourselves knit together by this bond of love. We must make one another's condition our own. Rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us. Right. So instead of it being a government plan to take care of the poor, it's you get your stuff and then you voluntarily take care of your neighbor. Relationships are established where you love and care for each other. So these pilgrims came over because they wanted, they were distressed of conscience. This is the, the Roger Williams that founded Rhode Island plaque. Another one, Roger Williams, freedom of conscience. What's the freedom of conscience? They wanted an atmosphere where you could worship God where you weren't forced to worship God. What's that about? God loves you. He wants you to love him back. And love, by definition, must be voluntary. Right? And so let's look at this in the last few minutes. And I said this maybe in one of my other talks while I was here, but I just love explaining the gospel this way. Why did God make you? So, you know, God is all-powerful, and he exists for eternity. There has never been a time when God has not existed. He makes everything. It's not so much that he knows everything. It's impossible for him not to know everything, from the smallest quark and electron and positron to the great expanse of the universe. You know, to get an idea how big God is, in 2003, they focused the powerful Hubble telescope on a spot in the sky where there was nothing. The spot was tiny, the size of a grain of sand held between your fingers against the night sky, nothing there. After 11 days, they developed the images. In that spot was 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. And this is the picture, the Hubble ultra deep space field, the furthest picture ever taken away from planet Earth. And every dot you see is a galaxy with billions of stars. And they recently launched the Hubble, the the James Webb telescope on Christmas last year. And 
this is that same picture, but notice the red shift. Light travels in waves, with blue being the shortest and fastest wave and red being the slowest wave. And so they saw the red shift, which means you're seeing these galaxies moving away from us and you're seeing the slow light, so to speak. And they've now estimated that the observable universe is 93 billion light years across, and get this, still expanding at the speed of light. And the largest star they found is Stevenson 2-18. It's a super gas giant. It's so large. If you were to place Stevenson 2-18 in our solar system, it would engulf the orbit of Saturn, the sixth planet from the sun. We're the third planet from the sun. Could you imagine one single star, fat, enormous, and God made it all. And he made you. Why would he make you? You know, God is love. And he loves everything he created, but he was never loved back. Right? I mean, everything he makes follows laws. Laws of planetary motion, laws of gravity, laws of physics, laws of optical, laws of quantum mechanics. Everything's laws. And all the animals follow instinct. It's basically a software program. As cute as little dogs are, they're just responding to the, their instinct. And all the animal world follows instinct. They're just following the way God programmed them to. You know, I looked up the word angel in the Bible. It appears 200, 289 times, 289 times in the King James Bible. Never once does it say the angels love God. They worship him. They praise him. They glorify him. They deliver his judgments, right? The plagues of Egypt, right? They uh, are deliver his messages to Daniel and to, you know, Mary, the mother of Jesus. They are heavenly witnesses. Jesus says, I'll confess you before the angels, but they are not made in God's image and Jesus did not die on the cross for angels. They are brilliant and mighty and powerful, but they are created for a purpose. Why are we created? We're not very smart and we're not very powerful. Why would God make us? We can't really offer this being that creates 93 billion light years worth of universe. What could you offer him? Nothing except maybe your love. And love, by definition, must be voluntary. So in this framework of everything he controls, time, matter, space, energy, he intentionally created something he doesn't control, your will. Now, he could control it if he wanted to, but that would defeat the very reason he made you different than everything else. And he doesn't, he doesn't need your love. He's not incomplete in any way, and your love somehow completes him. No, he is complete all by himself. He doesn't need your love, but he wants it. Parents don't need the love of their children, but they want it. We are beings created with the capacity to love God. And, um, and the, I throw in, God created light. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. If God created light, he's obviously faster than light. Einstein's theory of relativity is that if you could travel the speed of light, for you, time would stand still. God created light, he's faster than light. So for God, time effectively stands still. We'll never understand that, but there is the verse in the Bible that says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. In other words, we're moving in slow motion compared to God. God exists in the ever-present now. I am that I am. So for him to create our space-time reality, he had to create this bubble where everything moves in slow motion compared to him. Now, why is that important? because we get to make our little free will decisions, but he can readjust every atom in the universe so that his will is gonna take place. So it's our limited free will in the context of his unlimited sovereign will. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, that's okay. Um, <laughs> why did God make you? He made you because you have the capacity to love him. But love by definition must be voluntary. The moment he would force you to love him, he himself would know he's forcing you to love him and he would know your response is not a love response. The more you love someone, the more you want that someone to love you back. God loves you infinitely. He has an infinite desire for you to love him back, but he'll never force you. And then there's the second thing, is God has to hide himself behind his creation. Because if he ever revealed himself to you in all of his omnipotent, 
universe creating power brighter than a trillion trillion suns, your response, if you didn't melt, would be like the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, I fell at his feet, he's dead. It would be immediate and instinctive. In the presence of such power, so he has to hide himself so that you have the opportunity to have a free will. People say, if God's real, why doesn't he show himself? Because the moment he shows himself in all of his power, your free will is gone. In the presence of such power, boom, you'd be instantly on your face. And it would be an instinctive response, not a love response. And God said, I, I can do instinctive all eternity long. He is so awesome. He's interested in this voluntary thing. So he hides himself, right? People say, you know, if he's real, why doesn't he show himself? Because the moment he shows himself, your free will's gone. But the same hiding of himself that allows you to have an opportunity to use your free will necessitates that you have faith. People say, oh, it's so hard having faith. I wish God could just show. Well, if he showed you, you wouldn't need faith anymore, but you wouldn't have a free will anymore. I, I use a way of explaining this, of God hiding himself because he wants your love, not he wants it voluntary. So imagine if a billionaire has a son who goes to college, flies in on his private jet, drives up in his Lamborghini. He's got gold rings, Rolex watch, fancy clothes. He's gonna have every girl on campus wanting to meet him. But if he lays all that aside and drives up in an old clunker, got holes in his jeans, right? The uppity girls are gonna ignore him. But then there's a girl that likes to study with him in the library and they eat together in the cafeteria and they become friends and she takes heat from the click for hanging around this nobody guy. But she believes in him. They fall in love, they get engaged. And then he says, hey, I wanna take you back to meet my dad. And they're like driving up to this castle mansion estate and the girl's like, whoa, you didn't tell me about all this. He knows that she loves him for him, not because of all of his stuff. Jesus laid aside his glory born in a manger, a barn, a, a meal trough for an animal. It says in Isaiah 53 of the Messiah, there's nothing in his countenance that would make us want to desire him. He laid all that aside. He only wants those that love him for him. So God created you as a free will being. He wants you to love him, but he'll never force you to love him. But he created you for the purpose. That's how we're different than everything else. But he has to hide himself so you have the opportunity to to use your free will because he is so awesome. If he just gave you a peek, your free will's gone. You're just gonna respond. So he hides himself, but there's a third thing. He's just and he cannot help it. He forever was and forever is and forever will be just, which means he has to judge every single sin. If God does not judge a sin, by default, he's giving consent to the sin. It's called the rule of tacit admission, T-A-C-I-T. -T. It's in common law. It, you've seen it in a wedding ceremony where the pastor says, anybody that's against this wedding, speak now or forever hold your peace. If you're sitting there silent, your silence is giving consent to the wedding. If there are sins going on and God is silent and not judging the sin, by default, he's giving consent to the sin. And if God gives consent to one sin, one time, he denies his just nature. He denies himself. He ungods himself. He's kicked out of heaven. And he's not gonna get kicked out of heaven and he is not gonna deny himself and he is gonna judge every sin. So he could never be loved back, right? If he creates free will beings, hides himself so we have the free will. But if we step out of line one time, he has to judge us because if he doesn't judge us by silence, he's giving consent and he's denying himself. So he could never be loved back until he had a plan. And the plan is his own son would become a man, would become the lamb and take the judgment for all the sins. Charles Wesley, go to him. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Abraham and Isaac are going to the top of Mount Moriah. And Isaac says, Father, we have the wood for the sacrifice and we have the coals for the sacrifice, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And it has a double meaning. I'm trusting that God will have a ram up in the bush who is caught by his head in thorns, a crown of thorns. But there's a second meaning. God will provide himself the sacrifice. God the Father 
provided his own son, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten son of God, in the plan of redemption that was hidden from ages. It was a hidden plan. It says if the princes of this world had known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. The apostle Paul called it the mystery of salvation. It was a hidden plan. Jesus comes to earth, becomes a man, and he takes the judgment, the wrath of God that we all deserve upon himself. So God is completely just in that he judges every sin. He's completely love in that he provided the lamb to take the judgment. You say, well, how can one person's death pay for, well, there's billions of us and we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all deserve eternal damnation. How can one person pay for it all? Jesus is divine. He experienced judgment in a dimension we will never know. You know, the book of Revelation, read through it a thousand times, still trying to figure it out, but one thing seems clear, it's God that is pouring out the vials of judgment in the book of Revelation, all right? Lamb breaks the seal, the angel throws the center, the angel blows the trumpet, the angel pours. Why is that? Well, this is the final judgment. So God, he's a just God, he has to judge every sin he missed along the way. So you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and say, God, there were these sins way back when and, and you didn't judge this one. Um, were you silent? Were you giving consent to the sin? Is there a part of you that's unjust that we didn't know about? Uh-uh. It says the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. And the angels cry out, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. Nobody's going to question for the rest of eternity that God judged sin. But that's the final judgment. He won't have to do any more judging for the rest of eternity. But in that sense, Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. He took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross. It says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Jesus experienced that death on the cross as if it was a thousand years. That's why he was sweating drops of blood in the garden. You know, I have a degree in accounting, so I like things that balance. An eternal being, Jesus, who's innocent, suffering for a finite, limited period of time, is equal to all of us finite, limited beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Let me say that again. An eternal being who's innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Infinity times finite equals finite times infinity. An unlimited being suffering for a limited period of time is equal to all of us limited beings suffering for an unlimited period of time. Jesus literally suffered the equivalent of eternal damnation in all of our places, and he's the only one that could have done it. And out of love for the Father and out of love for you and me, he became the lamb. He took the judgment of God upon himself. This way you and I can approach this eternal, universe-creating, omnipotent, God, who's completely just, and not have to worry about being judged. The lamb, amen. The lamb is his idea. The, the lamb is his way to love you without having to judge you. So he can love you and you can love him back and you can mess up and he does not judge you, but he can still maintain that he's a just God because the judgment went on Jesus and we're approaching him through Jesus. We are in Christ. Isn't it a brilliant plan? It's God's plan. So we can spend the rest of eternity with God, loving God and God loving us. And it's not based on us being good enough. We're in Christ and we're forever in Christ. You know, it says in Psalms, a thousand years is as yesterday to the Lord when it is past. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus died on the cross. To God the Father, that was two days ago. For the rest of eternity, to God the Father, Jesus' death will have just happened. And whenever we approach him, he'll have that fresh in his mind that Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. We are forgiven. That's why we sing praise songs to Jesus that he is the door, he is the way. It is through him that we can access this universe creating omnipotent God and not be judged and spend eternity with the Lord. Today, if you've not yet done it, put all your faith in the lamb, right? Instead of you doing good works, like piling them on the altar, hope, like, like Cain hoping to have 
yourself earn brownie points with God. Yo, I did this, I did this, I did this. Instead of you doing good works, trying to earn brownie points with God, you're already accepted by God through faith in the blood of Christ. And then he fills you with his Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit does the works through you. And his yoke is easy and his burden's light. And it's him loving through you the lost and dying world. Right? Loving the unlovable, getting involved in church, getting involved in some kind of ministry, getting involved in, in hearing a good message, but letting it flow through you that you're, you're part of the body of Christ. He fills you with his Holy Spirit. And, he, and there's nothing more fulfilling than letting the Holy Spirit use you to touch people's lives, to minister to people, to let them, to see their lives be changed. And it's not you, but it's the Holy Spirit. It's like a, a magnet that, that the, they're being drawn to you, but they're being drawn to the Christ in you, to the Holy Spirit, and they're being drawn through Jesus to the Father. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to put all your faith in the Lamb. That why did God make you? Because he wants your love, but he'll never force you. He's made the way, he's opened the door, he's paid the price. He's given you freedom of conscience. It's just your heart. He pulls on your heart like a, like a, a gentle magnet. He's pulling, he'll never force you, but he'll, he wants your love so bad. That he set up this whole thing out of all of universe and all of eternity. He set up this little bubble of our reality and our little world and our little earth so that we can have the opportunity to love him. He sends his love to your heart and all you do is just respond through Jesus. Pastor. Well, if that spoke to you, if it didn't speak to you, we're going to have prayer up here for you. <laughs> but it wouldn't be complete to give everybody the opportunity that's never received the Lord to do that right now. So Southwest Campus or online campus, if you've, you know, here's the one thing about God. He's all powerful, just as Bill said, in so many different ways. He could make us do anything. If he just unveiled himself, if we could survive it, and yet, he just needs an invitation. I've had people come up to the altar. I've had people talk. They said, well, I don't know if there is a God. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. How about you invite him in? And if there is no God, you have nothing to lose. But if there is a God, he will come into your life. Because he did say, ask. And so we need to ask. So right now, I want us all to pray online, Southwest here, if you've never received the Lord and you're ready to receive him and invite him into your life, he's ready to answer you and he will answer you and he will come in. So Father, right now we pray for any and everyone under the sound of my voice. We command any and every hindering spirit, anything trying to hold anyone back from a relationship with you. Lord, we bind that up. And Lord, I pray for every heart right now in Jesus' name. And if you're ready to do that, I want you to pray with me. I want you to pray with all of us out loud so you can hear it with your own ears. Pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I receive you. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive my sin. Wash me in your precious blood. And I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord a praise this morning for just speaking to us so, so powerfully? If you prayed that prayer, we're going to have our prayer folks coming up here. And uh, if you're watching online, we've got a link for you to go to. And uh, we can, let's stand up on our feet this morning. How many of you were blessed by Bill Federer this morning? Wow. I think we learned some things, didn't we?